All right, so this week I wanted to start something a little bit different. I had been doing on Monday nights the pastor's Bible study as a Zoom meeting. And we got together for several weeks starting there, there toward the end of the summer. While a lot of our things were on break, our home group Bible studies and, and our men's and women's studies were on break. And so I started that up for, to have a way for us as a church community to open up the Word of God and just spend some time together looking to see what he had to say to us. And we answered some great questions. We did a series, What Does the Bible Say About? It was a question and answer series. And we answered some good questions, I think. But now that things are starting back up again, school year's back in session and our home group Bible studies are back in session now. They all started this past week. If you haven't plugged into one yet, let me foot stomp that and encourage you to get involved in one. We have four. Maniago, Rovereto, Portanone, Bruniera. The, the sign-up uh, thing for those is on the Facebook page, so check that out. The contact information's there. As those started back up, as the women's study started back up on every other Tuesday night, and the lift events are happening again, Awana started back up on Sunday nights. By the way, sign your kids up for Awana. I decided I, I didn't want the pastor's Bible study to become just one more thing that people felt like they had to go to. So what I thought I'd do instead is I'll just record a little message, a devotion, maybe even a short lesson. I'll record it here on YouTube, and then I'll just post it. And then you can watch it at your leisure. And so if, if it fits into your schedule, you can watch it. Hopefully it's a little bit of an encouragement, a little bit of a time where you learn something and we, we take something out of God's Word, you can apply it to your life. So we're starting that today. And the one thing I wanted to talk about today was something that really hit me this morning as I was having my quiet time. As a church community, we are going through a Bible reading plan in the YouVersion Bible app. And we talk about this a lot on Sunday, the YouVersion Bible app, how we use it as kind of a church app. And one of the things we've been doing for the last several months is we've been having these Bible reading plans where as a group, we're, re we're reading the same things together. And there's an opportunity for you to comment and, and you can see other people's comments of how God spoke to them. And so we're doing one right now and it's called Epic. And this is a four-part series, a four-part Bible study series. We're in part one. And this is what the information in, uh, in the U version has to say about this Epic Bible study plan, or Bible reading plan. It says it's a four-part plan to read the books of the Bible that tell of the historical events. And so let me encourage you, we just started the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 8. And that's what I want to talk about here in this little devotion time today. But if you have you want to get involved in that reading plan, just let me know. I'll send you an invite for it. And then you can jump in. Just You'll start on Exodus 9 if you jump in tomorrow. And then you can read along with the rest of us, see the comments that people are making as God speaks to them through His Word. But here's what struck me this morning. We're reading through Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 7 the plagues start, right? You remember the plagues, the 10 plagues that, that God brought on Egypt. And they start in Exodus chapter 7, the first one where God turns the water into blood. And then over into Exodus chapter 8, there are three more plagues that God brings in Exodus chapter 8. He brings the frogs, the plague of frogs, he brings the plague of gnats, and then he brings the plague of flies. Now, I don't know about you, but when I have read those, have you thought sometimes, those are really weird plagues, God? I mean, I get, I get turning the water into blood. I get that. There's something that'll get your attention, right? The rivers all turned to blood. It said the water in the pots in their house, all that turned to blood. Boy, that'll get your attention. I get that one. Frogs? Gnats? Flies? Boils? Well, they seem a little bit weird to us, right? But if you study, we're not going to unpack this today, but if, if, you, if you dig into it, you study those, each of those plagues represented to the Egyptians one of their major gods. And so what God was doing in bringing these plagues that seem so weird is one by one he was defeating 
their gods, showing them just how impotent their gods were before him. But that's not really what grabbed my attention as I read Exodus chapter 8 today. What grabbed my attention was this. The innocent people in Egypt who suffered from these plagues. Now, the scripture tells us that Egypt was oppressing the nation of Israel. But when, when you read about it, it's Pharaoh and it's his workers. Those are the ones who are doing the oppressing. But I was thinking about, what about the average Egyptian? Joe Egyptian. He and his family, who they don't really think much about the Israelites. They know they're there. Maybe they don't interact with them at all. But you know those frogs showed up in his living room too. Those gnats, when he went outside, those gnats were all over him too. Them flies were everywhere in his house, on his property too. And I couldn't help but to think, what about the average Egyptian who suffered these plagues too? Why do the innocent suffer, right? That's a question that people have, and particularly those who are opponents of Christianity. They say, well, God is so good. If he's such a powerful God, well, how come he allows the innocent to suffer? Why do the innocent suffer in this world? I think we see it clearly in that account, in that story. The innocent are suffering because Pharaoh's hardened his heart. The sin of Pharaoh has caused that innocent suffering. Now, I'm not talking innocence in a theological sense. In a theological sense, none of us are innocent. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. From, from that perspective, a theological sense, every one of us is sinful, where none of us are innocent. But God's Word makes a distinction too, and we see it in life. There is a distinction in this world between those who have committed sin or committed a crime and they are suffering the direct consequence of that and people who had nothing to do with that decision and yet they're suffering from that as well. And the question then is why do the innocent suffer? And I think we see a key bit of the answer there in Exodus chapter 8. The innocent suffer because of our sin. Listen, there are no such things as victimless sins. Someone will suffer. Now, you may not know who that is. You may not ever find out. It may not be immediate, but other people, there are second and third order effects to the sins that you and I commit. Somebody's going to suffer because of that. And God takes no delight when the innocent suffer. He's not up in heaven chuckling. He's not care careless about what's going on. He's not wagging his finger and saying, well, you all made your bed, now lie in it. Listen to what the Word of God says. This is Proverbs chapter 6. I had my pen in there earlier to mark it, and then the pen fell out, so you're just going to have to bear with me as I flip the page there. Proverbs chapter 6, this starts in verse 16. There are six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, this is verse 17, a lying tongue, and listen to this one, hands that shed innocent blood. See, there are things that God hates. God hates sin, absolutely. God hates these things. And one of the things that made the list, God hates hands that shed innocent blood. God takes no delight in that. And the innocent suffer in this world, not at God's hands. Not because God is not good. Not because God is not powerful. But because God is good. God's goodness is shown in the fact that you and I have a choice. To obey Him or not. When God created Adam and Eve, He put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right there in the garden. And, and I preached through Genesis about a year ago or two years ago. And after I preached through Genesis 3, somebody asked me that question. If God knew they were going to eat the fruit, why did he put the tree there? 
because God wanted to give Adam and Eve a choice. Love only matters if it's chosen. Obedience is only obedience if it's chosen. If, if a computer does what it does, it's not a choice that the machine makes. It has no other options. God didn't create us as robots. He created us as beings that he wants us to choose to obey him and choose to love him. That's when it matters. That's when it's real. That's why we have a choice. The consequence, the cost of God giving us a choice, of loving us that much, the consequence of that freedom is that we can misuse it. And when we misuse it, that's when the innocent suffer. Listen, I do want these little messagettes to, to be a word of encouragement to you. And I know we're up to this point talking about sin and talking about the suffering. Well, that's not really a word of encouragement. But here is the word of encouragement. Sin and suffering don't have to have the last word. We're all born sinners. We've talked about that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God provided an answer. He sent His Son, Jesus to come to this world and live a perfect life, die on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin and mine, that our sins can be forgiven, that we can be reconciled unto Him, that we can spend eternity in heaven with Him. And listen, if you don't know for a fact that you're saved, you don't know what that even means, you've got questions about salvation, how do I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die? I want you to contact me. Pastor at avianobaptist.church or hit me on Facebook Messenger, hit me on WhatsApp. I'd love to talk with you about that, how you can have your sins forgiven and know for certain when you die, you'll spend eternity in heaven with God. Sin doesn't have to have the final answer eternally. It doesn't have to have the final answer now either. If you are the one who has committed a sin and you know there are people who are innocent, who are suffering because of that, Here's a word of encouragement for you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's an open-ended promise. If your sin is causing suffering, whether it's causing suffering or not, bring it to God. Confess it to him. You are not telling him anything he doesn't already know. But he wants to hear you say it. He wants to hear you admit it. Bring it to him. Confess it to him. Repent and he will be faithful every single time to forgive you. And then you know what? Go to that person who you know is suffering because of your sin and ask their forgiveness. Confess that sin to them and ask their forgiveness. If you are the innocent victim, you are the one who is suffering, let me encourage you. Sin and suffering doesn't have to have the final answer for you either. First of all, forgive that one who has caused that suffering in your life. I know that feels counterintuitive. You say, yeah, but I'm, I'm hurting here, and if I forgive, well, then that just gives them license to do it again. If I forgive, that's telling them it's okay. You know what? It's none of those things. You know what forgiveness does? Forgiveness frees you from the bitterness. It frees you from the anger. It frees you from that burning, boiling anger that's inside you. That's what forgiveness does. Forgive that one who has done something and now you're suffering as a result. But you know what else? Come before the Lord. Once again, we, we look at the Word of God. Proverbs, or Psalms rather, Psalm 147. Psalmist said this, Psalm 147, verse 3. It's talking about God. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Listen, now that's a word of encouragement. That though sin has racked this world 
And though sin has brought consequences in, in maybe in your life, and sin has brought suffering in, in other people's lives, even those who were innocent, sin and suffering doesn't have to have the final answer. God and His love and His glory will have the final answer. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you today. I hope you have a great week. If you have questions and you would like me to, to address something some more and talk about something some more, write your question here at the bottom of the Facebook post where you caught this link. Send me a message, Pastor Aviano, Baptist.Church, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear your questions and help you understand this and unpack this a little bit more. God bless you. Have a great day, and I hope you have a great week.